This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. You know, there is a reason why I, in the past, have tended not to watch Hard Knocks. And the most recent... Okay, did it. (laughs) (laughs) The most recent episode of this edition, of this season, kind of reminded me of that. Uh, and, And I'll explain why in a little bit here. But... I feel like there is something that Hard Knocks just kind of misses on that I really, I mean, I know they probably don't get much of a choice, but I feel like it's almost like a no brainer. Like this is something you shouldn't miss on if you want people to watch this damn thing and care about it. But Andrew, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you? Not bad. It's been a busy week and uh, weekend was very busy and now a busy start to the week. But, Feel you know, that. that that's just kind of how life goes and you move on. And but I'm glad to be here talking some sports. I, I I thoroughly enjoy and look forward to getting to hop on my computer and talk sports for an hour or so. However long we decide to do it, sometimes shorter, sometimes <laughs> it's longer. Each and every week, it's I find it a lot of fun. I, I definitely enjoy it. But obviously, you know guys, what my favorite part yeah. of this episode of Hard Knocks was. Well, what? you can finish your intro if you. <laughs> obviously, guys, this is the fan <laughs> report. I'm Nick, and with me is Andrew. Where it's by fans, poor fans. You can follow us on Twitter at Real Fan Report. Thank you to Detroit Sports Podcast for continuing to produce this this podcast. I guess we'll just say. Each and every single week, you can follow them on Twitter at, at Detroit Podcast as well. This is episode number 171, and we're still in the offseason. I mean, is it still technically football offseason if we're in preseason? I guess technically not. No, no, it's, we're in preseason. Right. So I guess I can't say we're in the offseason any longer. We is can it still for technically a red light if it's a yellow light? Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> um. I, but I feel like there's not much to talk about with preseason. Like, what can you explain? Can you give me one thing you want to you want to talk about from the game against the Colts? Because I got nothing. Starters uh, didn't play nothing. a single second. Like, I, I have absolutely nothing to talk about from that game. The the, the only thing I'd really want to talk about from that game was um was how I couldn't find Hard Knocks on the sidelines. I was looking for them. <laughs> <laughs> they <laughs> blend in very. <laughs> I obviously Jeff Okuda did play. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know how much he played to be exact, but he didn't really show up much in the stat sheet, which could be a good Mm -hmm. or bad thing for a cornerback. Probably means he didn't get beat a ton or he Mm -hmm. just got beat every single time he had the ball was thrown his way, which would be a Mm -hmm. really bad thing. I did hear a report today. However. I'm very surprised that I haven't seen anything about Jeff Okuda on Hard Knocks. I'm just, I'm just so saying. Am I. Uh, I so thought that would be a story. That and Hard I Knocks, think like, that's one of those things. And this is actually one of kind of leading me into my discussion here that I wanted to open the show with. Mm-hmm. I think the team is doing that on purpose, where they're not really making him as available to Hard Knocks because they want him to be hyper focused on his. Mm-hmm. One, his rehab two getting back into the swing of things, getting back to full speed and then just hyper focusing on progressing as a player because he hasn't really gotten to fully do that since he was drafted. Mm-hmm. He was battling injuries on and off in his first year until he only I think he only played, what, seven games. And then last Is that why year, Ben Johnson hasn't showed up because he needs to focus. Why what? Is that why Ben Johnson showed up either because he needs to focus. I can't explain that one. You've gotten I'm, li- quite I'm literally. I'm going my third from last week because he's just a boring human. Probably. You've gotten quite literally <laughs> every single coach on this show but him, except maybe the special teams coach. But <laughs> there's no doubt there. I just I feel like the team is part of the reason why he hasn't shown mm-hmm. up. And that's part of my issues with the hard knocks and why I've kind of shied away from watching it or just ha- outright haven't watched it in previous seasons, because while it's nice to hear some of these untold stories of the lesser known names, mm-hmm. I'd be lying if I told you I gave a shit. Mm-hmm. I don't care to hear about 
Pimpleton story. And it, I mean, Izzy, we heard about it in the first episode when he was in the, the cold tubs mm. with Aiden Hutchinson. Honestly, that's really all I need to hear about it. That was the first I ever heard of him. Same. <laughs> and that was really all I needed to hear about him. Like, I, I didn't need any more Izzy on screen. The guys I want to see on screen are the Hawkinsons, the Goffs, the Swifts, which the only guy, mm. the only time we've gotten to see DeAndre Swift on screen was when he was getting destroyed by Deuce Staley. Like, mm. I, I want to hear from the names. Mm-hmm. I want to hear how the big names in camp. Like, I, I like that we got to hear a lot from Aiden Hutchinson. I love mm-hmm. that. I think that was awesome for them to focus on Aiden Hutchinson in the first week and mm-hmm. what his story of entering into the pros is like, how his family is involved and, and things like that. Mm-hmm. But that was all we got. We got nothing from yeah. Hawkinson, nothing from Goff, nothing from Swift, really. Nothing from DJ Chark or Jamison Williams, which, again, Williams is probably because I technically think he's not available to the media. I don't know if the NFL would call Hard Knocks the media. Mm -hmm. But regardless, I want to hear stories from these names. You know, we in years past, like here's an here's an example. Do you think it's because like they're like there isn't as much of a story. Like we know what guys like Hawkinson are. We know what golf is like, but you know what? I feel like hard knocks is to show the fan, the average fan or to show fans what camp is like for the guys that they love to watch on Sundays. Mm -hmm. What is camp like for these guys? Okay. Well, what are the guys we care about watching? Well, it's the names and I get it. If you want to throw in a story, that's a cool story every now and then like Izzy's story. That's fine. If you want to show a little bit of the camp, you know, the the guys who are at roster bubble guys battling it out, that's fine, too. But we're getting nothing of the big names almost. Mm -hmm. And most of these guys, like, I don't care about. I don't care to watch anything from guys who I know are not going to be on this roster. You know, I did. I did glean something important from uh, from this most recent episode of Hard Knocks, though. The. uh was it a linebackers coach? Was it? I don't think it. Was. I don't think it was AG. I think it was a linebackers coach. If I remember correctly. But anyway, he was uh, talking about who's going to be the. Uh, it might have been actually. Actually, it might have been AG. I have to go back and rewatch it now. He was talking about who's going to be the. Uh, who's going to begin the start for uh, the the preseason game against the Colts? And uh, basically said, "I'm tell you guys right now, Alex is probably not going to play much, if at all, on Sunday." And like. Alex Anzalone, like, super surprised, like, oh, shit, like, you, Who? I'm, I'm, I'm Alex Anzalone. Oh, Anzalone, the linebacker. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, it looked like he was the first man out in terms of, like, all right, this is the first guy making the roster <laughs> in terms of the linebackers. Does that surprise you at all? That he wasn't playing at all on Colts on Sunday? No, I- that, like, he was the first one called out in terms of Alex and, like, he's the one that's safe, like, the first one that's safe in terms of the linebackers. I'll be honest with you, it doesn't surprise me that much because I feel like they, I'm not saying Anzalone's a good player, but I feel like he does what the coaches want him to do. He just doesn't do really much that well. <laughs> uh, but he kind of oh, fits. Oh, Calvin Shepard, that's who it was. Sorry. Okay, linebacker coach, second, Calvin remember, Shepard, yeah. yes. Mm-hmm. He just, he just kind of fits. Like, I feel like he is a safe roster guy. Mm-hmm. I don't think there's any question that Alex Anzalone's going to be on this roster. He is. He's, oh, he's yeah. I almost guarantee a spot, especially with how weak oh, the linebacker is. Yeah, I would have been surprised if we cut Anzalone. I think what surprised me is he was like the first guy that that came out. I was like, all right, no, he's like on the roster. He's not playing Sunday or Saturday or whatever the hell the game was. I, again, I if there was a guy that had any question at all, mm-hmm. then maybe he would have played. But he's a yeah. guy that he does. There is no question there. So what's mm-hmm. the point? I yeah. feel like there was probably a few guys that was the mm-hmm. case with. But the only guy out. they showed that that he said was he, he uh, turned to Malcolm Rodriguez and he goes, you're you're getting the start, but you're only playing 20 snaps. When I say you're done, you're done. Like, get the hell off the field, because apparently in uh, in the first preseason game, preseason game, they threw a fit about being pulled off the field. <laughs> <laughs> Which fine. It's preseason. Get off the field. <laughs> but honestly, Rodrigo's played great. He's really kind of stepped up. It does kind of show how weak the linebacker core is that a sixth round pick can come in here and kind of be the bright spot. Mm -hmm. But 
if he turns out to be a good player, he turns out to be a good player. Like that's a huge find for Brad Holmes in, in the sixth round. And we loved it when he was drafted. We talked about it on the show when he was drafted on how much we loved it, but he's kind of showing why and mm-hmm. great on Brad Holmes, great on Rodrigo, great on Calvin Shepard and Aaron Glenn. And you know, mm-hmm. you may have found something here, but yeah. there it, again, it's just like Aiden Hutchinson or any other rookie who, you know, is going to be on this roster. What's the point? There's no need to play him at this point. You're good. (laughs) But one thing I did find interesting, and and this is a report I heard today, that Jeff Okuda has not locked down that starting corner position. He has not locked down CB2. Between him and Will Will Harris. Harris, Who is a converted safety. Uh, (laughs) It's still a battle. After Mm -hmm. two weeks of the preseason, we're going into week three of the preseason. Does that at all worry you about the potential for Okuda to actually be good? Like, I, I would have thought, okay, if Okuda's going to have this job, he would have gotten it by now. That he would have mm-hmm. been able to, if he earned, if he was good enough to have this job, to be a starting corner in this league, mm-hmm. there would almost be no doubt by the end of week two of preseason. But we're at yeah. a point where I've been, I've been heard, or I've heard that it's, locking, or it's locked up, it's neck and neck, like... Mm-hmm. Yeah, because it's not like Will Harris has had this like fantastic no. preseason. Both Okuda and and Will Harris have uh, had very average up yeah. and down preseasons. Like so, yeah, that that does kind of that you're 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 on the verge of you're still in a battle with a converted safety who by no means is anything stellar to put him inside that. He's not so. like <laughs> if Will Harris is the starter come day you know come week one, we have a massive hole at the secondary at at the second corner position mm-hmm. a massive hole there and frankly i would yeah. argue we have a massive hole at the top corner position too mm-hmm. i like our warrior he isn't a number one corner he's a number two at best he is on this team <laughs> well that's not saying much because look at what you have opposite there like will harris and jeff okuda there is even a battle for that number one corner spot it's just it's given it's a warrior <laughs> well he's the only guy that's that can play cornerback. <laughs> yes, yeah. The fact that you're having to convert a safety to corner to compete for the other starting spot is what's scary. Uh, is okay. Let me ask you this. Yeah. What is the weaker position groups? Secondary, secondary or linebacker? Excuse me. I'm I'm going secondary. It's certainly looking that way. Like I can at least name a few linebackers that I'm like they can at least contribute. <laughs> like, I can't really do that. Yeah, at least at Malcolm Rodriguez. <laughs> like there is at least something exciting about the linebacker core. I, I am so about. I will be honest with you. I, I still like am hesitant with Rodrigo. Like, is it being like is is uh is it, a little just is HBO much. trying to play up that story? Like, or is I, he really I do you can easily things. make things look good, like you can easily edit things in a way where yes like it looks like the coaches are just heaping praise on him constantly and looks like he's the best player in camp like you could i do think there you is could a make it look that, that way on camera i do think there is a little bit of that and i mean mm-hmm. we saw it happen with the media last year with Derek bar with Derek barnes and he never mm-hmm. really turned out to be anything in his rookie year mm-hmm. so i do think there is a little bit of glorifying rodrigo a little bit mm-hmm. but at some point where there's sizzle there probably is some stake yeah and in this case, I do think there is at least a little bit of stake. Do I think mm-hmm. he's going to be like this insanely good linebacker that the, that Hard Knocks is making him out to be like, oh, he's the best player in camp? No, I don't. Look, yeah. They haven't even shown him make a mistake. Like everything has been aces with Rodrigo right. in terms of what Hard Knocks has shown. Right. So it's like, that's why I feel like, are they making him look a little better than he is right I, now? I <laughs> absolutely think they are. But that doesn't mean he's not good. There's a oh, very, no, I'm not there's saying he's a not very good. Yeah. possible scenario where he comes out and – is the best linebacker on this team this season. Mm-hmm. And that's an, an entire po- a, a yeah. totally possible scenario. But mm-hmm. it's also not, is it really saying that much though? <laughs> no. Like this linebacking core is really, really weak and really, really thin. So I, I am curious to see how not only the second starting corner battle position battle comes through, but also how the linebacker core position battle comes out and also the battle between just the safe, the secondary and the linebackers to not be the weakest position group on this defense. Cause you know, the pass rush is probably going to be at worst, very slightly above average to average mm-hmm. at worst. 
probably average. Let's be real. But you, you, you know, you know what Hard Knocks should close out the season with? What the, the final scene of the season, and this is how the news should break is through Hard Knocks. You see Dan Campbell and Brad Holmes in the war room on the phone with the Bears making a trade for Roquan Smith. <laughs> well, they, the reports have come out that he is playing out his deal with the Bears. So I think, oh, really? yes, there I has been a that. report that came out and said that he is going to play out his deal with the Bears. Uh, so I don't think that's on the table any longer. I don't think enough teams Boo. are willing to give up that much to get him uh, for a rental, basically. Uh, mm-hmm. Granted, they would have probably extended him if they went and got him, but still. Mm-hmm. You don't see players moving around as much in the NFL, so usually if you right. get them, they'll right. and you pay them, they'll stay. You are a little bit more so now than you used to, but mm-hmm. still, uh, I I almost feel like they're going to close out Hard Knocks, mm-hmm. the season of Hard Knocks, with Aaron Glenn and Aubrey Pleasant talking to Okuda and telling him he won the starting job. That could be something they close out with. That would be an interesting storyline. You would have hoped that with. that would have been more of a storyline for the season if that's going to be their. Uh, they're parting shot, like right, but I I just kind of have a feeling that that's, <laughs> yeah, but I, I but, just uh, kind of have a feeling. One of my favorite parts of the episode was though uh, last night was um when they got Josh Adams to do stand up. He told he told TJ not TJ Hawkinson um Aiden Hutchinson that looks like a looks like a big giant boy band member. Like a big ass Backstreet Boy. <laughs> He's a big ass Backstreet Boy. They should just start calling him JC Shazé or something. Or ooh, Nick Carter. Can we just call him Nick Carter? <laughs> he said he, he was talking about like how he's been watching Hard Knocks on TV, and like he said, like they got y'all working out and building cars. That shit's sweet as hell. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see? Okay, I can't remember who it was, but someone. Like there, there was some flack thrown at the Hutchinson family, saying that they're just not, they're spoon fed, and it was more so like gearing it towards Hutchinson that he's spoon fed yeah. because his Anytime parents. You put are, a rich family on TV, you're gonna get that same. Flag. Right, but he, it was basically like his family is uh, sitting up in the suites during preseason games while one of the other players can't remember who it was. I'm Ross St. Brown's. Uh, yes, yeah. I'm Ross St. Brown's family is down in the stands and with the team and on the sidelines, like. What do you think? What do you make of that? And it was, no, wasn't it actually, wasn't it Amon St. Brown's dad who said that? Yeah. It, no, I don't think it was his dad that said it. I think people were just saying that, like, on Twitter. And stuff. Okay. All right. Um, but uh, I do wonder, like, do we have, like, last year, for example, did, did, did we have, like, DeAndre Swiss, family, or two years ago, did we have DeAndre Swiss family sitting? Like, is it based on the fact that you're a first or second round pick? Or is, like, because Amon St. Brown was, what, a fifth round pick? Yes. Does this draft a status? Steal. Does this draft status put you in there? I, w- I would hope that Emirates St. Brown's performance last season put you above. I was gonna you know, say. I was gonna say whatever. Like whatever Emirates St. Brown did last year should have kind of put him up into that status of a first round pick. Yeah, but basically, if um, unless the Hutchison family like paid up to to move up to the suites, like. Paid like an upcharge, move up to the suites. Then it's it's a bad look. Yeah, it's it's one hundred percent a bad look. Yeah, it. I don't know. Like it. Not that I don't, I don't think necessarily they say. Like I don't necessarily I, I, say it's a. I think bad you should look. give every if a direct. I think you should give all direct family either suites or some kind of or some kind of. Well, I mean, yeah, they've got because you got to imagine. There's a lot of players, so and there's not yeah, that true. many suites, so they're but either going to have more in town watching the game, right? But like you. <laughs> I still feel like there's enough of them to where they still want to make money off their suites. So maybe they have like a select four or five where players can sign up to get their family access to the suites. Maybe it's a rotating thing. Maybe like Hutch, Hutch's family hit the suites that game. Maybe St. Brown's family has the suites like some other. Maybe. I don't know. But I, I, (laughs) if they paid up, sure. It didn't look like they did because I'm pretty sure they were in the lion's suite, (laughs) but either way, like it, it, I mean, I don't want to look too far into it because, yeah. frankly, like it, it, we're talking about minor shit here. <laughs> like it doesn't yeah. matter. And we're talking about stuff that we actually don't know the story on. It's just optics. Is all it is. Yeah, it, it is just optics. Yeah. But, I, man, I'll tell you what. There's a lot of people that are talking about this Lions team now. Like it, mm-hmm. just looking at Twitter Didn't and, Dan and Campbell, looking at uh, take over the highest. Um, 
the best odds for. I do believe he is getting the most, the most um, attention in the gambling aspect for he, Coach of the Year. <laughs> he did have a pretty. Uh, I kind of want to say it was cliche, but it was also pretty fun of a speech that he uh, that they opened this episode with. Yes, yeah. He walked out with dirty pains. We got dusty shit off. <laughs> <laughs> Dust flying up from the pants and stuff. Like, right. It's a shit we got to get out of our system. <laughs> <laughs> he says man a lot. Yeah, man. Yeah. <laughs> um, all he does, man. Yep. It just, <laughs> I I feel like all every coach has these cr- has one of those crutches that they always say. They've got her, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. You're giving speeches so many times, you always got to have a crutch. But, you know, just being on social media and seeing Twitter, like even on like gambling Twitter for us, but for an ass, like sports gambling Twitter for, mm-hmm. you know, an angle. There's a lot of people talking about the Lions and putting money on the Lions and saying like this, this Lions team is it. They can do this. Like there, there's a lot of belief in this regime, this front office, these players to actually be. Doesn't that happen for team. every season of Hard Knocks? I don't think so. I feel like every team that's on Hard Knocks gets hyped up. When, when Hard Knocks was there with Jeff, with the Rams and Jeff Fisher was there, I don't remember people talking about that team. I remember people saying, "Yep, they're eight and they're an eight and eight team." And go figure, what they do? Like it, that's what Jeff well, Fisher because Jeff Fisher was your coach. <laughs> I don't know. I I don't necessarily feel like every year it is that way. Like yeah, there's probably a little bit of oh, this team looks good, but. I feel like I've we're to the point where people are willing to put their own money down on this team to actually do something, hit their over and wins, make the playoffs as a wild card, win the division. Like, I don't know. It gets me kind of excited. Like, it, it almost makes me want to believe that, yeah, this team could actually be good. Do I think this team can make the playoffs? Can and do I believe they will? No. Like, can? Mm-hmm. Sure. Do I believe they will? No. I don't think they're there yet. Mm-hmm. But... I also know the NFC North is pretty damn weak. Like I, I don't think there's a lot of good there. The Bears are terrible. The Packers are on a downtrend. The the Vikings are well, the Vikings. <laughs> I I think it's definitely within the realm of possibility that they could squeak out an an NFC wild card bit here. And mm-hmm. so frankly, like am I predicting them to? No. Mm-hmm. I am, however, going to say I do think they hit their over on wins this year. I don't think there's a doubt there. And frankly, mm-hmm. I would probably put my expectations in that realm. I expect mm-hmm. them to hit their over on wins this year. Yeah. yeah with that schedule, I'd hope so. Uh, yeah, I mean, you mix uh, Granted, <laughs> We talk about schedules every year and say, oh, this is an easy schedule. Do we really have an idea? No, we mm-hmm. don't. We have no idea how Carson Wentz is going to be with the Washington commanders. We have no idea how. Mm-hmm anybody's going to be with their team. Like mm-hmm. some teams, some years you're like, Oh, that's a 500 or less team. And then they turn mm-hmm. out to win tw- 10 to 12 games. Like we have no idea, yeah. but it certainly does look like a soft ass schedule. <laughs> <laughs> One more thing I want to call out from, uh, from hard knocks, by the way, <laughs> he's beginning clown on Twitter for it. I think it's just funny. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I think it's just funny, but, um, do Staley during the week of like the, when they were doing the joint practices with the Colts before the actual game. Mm-hmm. So he'd lost his voice before that. And um, he's like yelling at the running backs in the South after, because remember after the, um, after the first joint scrimmage, like the Lions got embarrassed by the Colts. Yes. And their red yeah. zone defense got destroyed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so like, obviously we didn't get to watch much of the joint scrimmage, but apparently the running back uh, group was not all that hot. And, after the game, like, uh, do you see pulls him on the side? He's like, We ain't in house. We're not blocking. What the fuck? <laughs> I'm like, with him. <laughs> It's not like Mickey Mouse was yelling. <laughs> yelling at the running back. <laughs> so it's meme worthy. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, but um, that was one of my favorite things. What'd you make of Jamal Williams just going at it? I loved it. I kind of did too. Like I, Jamal Williams is quickly becoming one of my favorite players in this team. I love yeah. the energy. I love the mentality. I love the the focus and the work ethic. Like he's just a fun guy to watch. Yeah. Uh, what did you? Okay, so now that you mentioned Deuce Staley, reminded me. What did you make of his comments about DeAndre Swift? 
I actually didn't have an issue with it. I'm like a lot of our local media. I had no issue with it. Like, what do you want? Like, it wasn't anything. I didn't think what he said was anything egregious. I know people thought they were playing off. He was playing off for the so cameras. So for, for the but, listeners who haven't heard what he said, go ahead and kind of give a paraphrase version of what he said. Well, one of the one of the points that's been gained the most flack was he uh, you saw throughout like the first preseason game. He was telling Andre so to run inside and basically take the holes that the offensive line has given him and stop trying to dance around and bounce outside. And um, he did like he did a play and, and do so. He said, "All right, nice run." Like that was that's what I'm talking about. That's what you got to do. And then there was like a red zone play and he bounced the outside. He got a touchdown out of it, but there was like a hole that he could have hit. And he basically told him like, "You know, you got the touchdown, but you like showing up as like this is where you should have been going. Like, the, like this was the hole that was right there for you. Like you didn't have to bounce to the outside and like." Obviously, he was like a little more aggressive about it because you're in the middle of a game, but um, and I, I just felt like people were unnecessarily up in arms about that. Like, yeah, even if you score a touchdown, doesn't mean you can't be coached. Like, it, I, it, the I think the people the issue that people are taking away from it was it made it sound like DeAndre Swift can't be an elite level back in this league. Like he he, he oh, it's the opposite. He was literally telling him like what I'm seeing. Like this was in the running back room. He was telling him, like, what, I, what I'm seeing from you, you have all the tools to be the best running back in this league. Like, you just need to go get it. And, like, like I don't want to see you, like, sulking, sitting quiet. Like, you need to reach inside. You need to be out there. You need to be aggressive. Like, he was, like, telling him, like, to bring it out of himself. Like, that's what Deuce is trying to do. He's trying to bring out the dog from DeAndre Swift. Right. But, but by putting that out there publicly like that, does that at all make you worry about DeAndre Swift's work ethic and mentality and and – his at the way he approaches yeah, cause the I game. didn't know he was that reserved until watching Hard Knocks. No, <laughs> I didn't either. Like I, I honestly thought he was out there and expressive and emotional, and you know, I, I did not know he was reserved, and I did not know he didn't seem like he had that dog in him to go get it and get after it and be the best player out there. So to see that he hasn't shown it, if he does have it, because I don't want to say he doesn't. But he hasn't mm-hmm. shown it. That kind of surprised me and did kind of worry me a little bit about whether or not this guy can be the guy. Uh, I still think in terms of talent, he's got all the talent in the world. I do think he can. He is one of the most talented backs in this league, without a doubt. Yeah. But does he have that dog in him to get after it? And I, I see what Deuce, and Deuce Daly is probably being a great coach by trying to bring it out of him. It's now up to mm-hmm. DeAndre Swift to respond to that. And how mm-hmm. does he respond to that? Does he mm-hmm. have the self-confidence and the mental fortitude to take a public lashing like that mm-hmm. and build on it, be better yeah. because of it? Mm-hmm. No, I, okay, I, I'm kind of hoping that with the exposure to Deuce Daly and with how aggressive I've seen Jamal Williams being, like it kind of rubs off in there, so he kind of takes on that personality. I hope he's of, he's taken some pointers yeah. from guys like that. I mean, Jamal mm-hmm. Williams has been a, a veteran in this league for a while mm-hmm. and has been that a leadership guy for a while and has had that mentality, so I hope so. Yeah. But finish your point. No, that, that, that was my point. Okay. <laughs> but like I just I I hope that guys like Deuce Staley and, and Jamal Williams are rubbing off on on DeAndre Swift because mm-hmm. those are the guys that have that dog in them. They mm-hmm. Deuce Staley was known for that in the league when he played, and now he's known for that as a head coach. The mm-hmm. Philadelphia Eagles players quite literally had a full on revolt that he mm-hmm. wasn't named the head coach over there. Yeah. It was a full on player mm-hmm. revolt. Yeah. So I goes and to tell you honestly, guys, watching with Hard Knocks, I can see why players like him. Like, oh, hundred percent! I love watching Deuce mm-hmm. Daly. He's he's a ton of fun to watch yeah. out there. I, you can absolutely tell why players love him. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that's about all I had on Hard Knocks. <laughs> yeah, I mean, same here. There's, it's tough to talk preseason football, honestly. Like it, I'll I, tell you, Hard Knocks is infinitely more interesting than preseason football. I'll, I'll tell yes, you that right now. Absolutely, and I. That's what I'll give it. <laughs> I am so excited. For what is it? September 11th? Is that it? I believe so. Yeah, September 11th. I am so excited for week one. Mm-hmm. I can't wait to actually watch some real football, mm-hmm. to bet on some real football, <laughs> to talk some real football. Mm-hmm. Like It's it's refreshing to have it. I feel like it, we haven't seen football since like it's been 84 years. Mm-hmm. And it's finally but, almost mm-hmm. back. But speaking of... um. People rubbing off on Detroit. 
personalities don't rubbing off on Detroit dare. athletes. Don't you There's dare. You take a that photo back. Making, you shut uh, your mouth. Making the rounds. Uh, Jane Ivey uh, oh. seemingly working out with Russell Westbrook. So now we've gotten Cade working out with KD. No. We've gotten Jane Ivey working out with Russell Westbrook. But people are pretty up in arms about this. Yeah. And, like, I, I understand why. But I do feel there's a bit of an overreaction here. I would much um, rather have KD working with players in the team because at least KD has won one a title. Granted, he mm-hmm. had a lot of help, more help than any player in the history of basketball. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he also is still like he he's a pro's pro in the mm-hmm. regard of like that dude focuses basketball and basketball only. Mm-hmm. I mean, reports came out. The dude's never had a girlfriend. Yep. Mm-hmm. So, but like, in all he's also honesty, really though, good and a really smart player too. Russell that, Westbrook like, is not. <laughs> let's but let's not act like Russell Westbrook isn't a future Hall of Famer and former MVP. No, like but he, he is based on personal accolades so, and but, individual things that he's done. Yeah, but what I'm trying to team. what I'm trying to say is there are positive things that Jay Ivey can take from Russell Westbrook, not. like using his size and athleticism to get to the rim. That's something that Russell Westbrook excelled at. Sure, but you know what? He's gonna teach him to player. do. It. He's gonna teach him to go about it the wrong way. He's gonna. Well, yeah, like, I'm. I'm hoping it, he's going he does to instill... in off of one workout glean ch- uh, stat chasing. I hope that that's not what comes off. My worry is he's going workout. to instill a mentality of extreme selfishness into Jaden mm-hmm. Ivey's head. Yeah, and that chasing. would be absolutely <laughs> detrimental to the growth mm-hmm. of this team. Yeah, it would piss Kate off. It would piss Stewart off. Like it would piss everybody mm-hmm. off. Like you know, I'm just. I'm I'm just hoping what what he can glean from Not Westbrook is is is, is is Westbrook's he's, most translatable NBA skill set of using size that lets him to get to the basket. But he's also that's probably what I'm hoping. Learning basketball mentality from him, and that's what I don't want. That's I don't what I hope want he gets him to Cade. learn. Ba- what? <laughs> that's what I hope he gets from Cade. <laughs> like, fine. I don't I don't know that Cade quite has enough experience in this league to be teaching basketball mentality just yet. But no, but you could you learn from watching too. Like it's yeah. doesn't have to be outright teaching. But I don't want Russell mm-hmm. Westbrook getting into Jaden Ivey's head about mm-hmm. basketball other than you know, you said it being able to use his size and athleticism to get to the rim. Fine. Mm-hmm. But there's a lot of players that can teach that that are not Russell Westbrook. Mm-hmm. Because I don't Russell want Westbrook I don't, was one of the best at doing that. At wonderful. Point, at one point in time, I don't give a damn. Dude's toxic. <laughs> I don't want him having his toxicity rubbing off on Jaden Jaden Ivy. Like, could you imagine? That would be a problem. We don't want that kind of problem in the locker room. Don't get that mentality in, in Jaden. I mean, I'd, I'd rather him work out with Ja, but he has worked out with Ja, so it's not like okay, wonderful. It's not in the cards. Keep Russell Westbrook. Um, you know what? Put a police barricade around any gym that that Jaden Ivey's at, and keep Russell Westbrook out. Are you on the? Put security outside the door. You on the list? Nope. Get, don't even. You're not in. You're not on the list, sir. Go away. Don't let him near our, near my young players, please. I don't want him having a single influence on them. There are other guys that we can get to help him learn how to use the size and athleticism to get to the rim. Tons of them. You don't even need a. a necessarily a player to help him teach. It could be a former player. Get there's tons of guys who can coach him. Tons. They don't have to be the guy who is known as an absolute cancer to his team. Like well, last I checked, cancer isn't contagious. Dude. <laughs> that mentality is contagious. He can easily, easily be poisoned by the toxic mentality that Russell Westbrook brings. A young mind like that is just open to taking any and all information in that it can. And if mm-hmm. Russell Westbrook poisons that, he will be it will it'll destroy his career. <laughs> like it, th- this dude's toxic as hell. Get him away from here. Get him away from my young talent. Did you, by the way, on a complete unassociate note, did you see um Chet Holmgren suffered ligament damage in his foot? What in the hell are the OKC Thunder doing allowing him to play in a pro-am? <laughs> this dude is made of glass. He is seven foot two, 112 pounds. And it happened while he was guarding LeBron. Okay, LeBron. I'm surprised be- LeBron. First of all, I'm surprised LeBron played in one, but two now? I'm. That, LeBron's shot. been in the league for a million yeah, years. Yeah, but he hasn't played he's in a pro-am built, in over a decade, big, if not more. But, but because he's moonlighting his career. Yeah. Why does he care anymore? 
<laughs> like that that's when you do stuff like that is when you're moonlighting. To have Chet Holmgren play in this is just mm-hmm. reckless. And it's reckless on Chet Holmgren's part too. Mm-hmm. Like why? First off, why the hell do you think you have the body to guard LeBron James? Mm-hmm. Well, it was like on a breakaway. Like I don't think he had much of a choice. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't matter you let him score you let him score you pull an all-star game steph curry oh, he, and you he crawl up into a ball on the floor <laughs> that's what you do he, he did score okay and again it's a pro-am you pull an all-star game steph curry crawl up into a ball on the floor mm-hmm. and don't mm-hmm. get hurt yeah like that the fact that the thunder are even allowing him to play in pro-ams is just beyond me. Like this yeah, is your prized possession. If I saw like Jaden or Cade were playing a pro, I'd be pissed. Right. You do that stuff when you're moonlighting your career. Mm-hmm. Or just not a big star. Yeah. Like if you're a big star, stay away from that shit. There's We've been seeing a lot of stars play. Like Jason Tatum is playing a couple now. I like, have seen there has been yeah. a big uptick in players yeah. playing and stuff like this. The Jonathan Murray. Yeah, the like. Drew League's gotten some names. Like there's been a lot of names that have played in some of this stuff that I'm like, why? <laughs> I, I get you want to play ball and I get you want to stay in shape in the offseason, but one, work out. Two, mm-hmm. play with other players. Mm-hmm. They know don't play with guys that have never touched the damn league and never That's why won. I don't give a shit. Like you see like all these like people like referencing stats that people got drew league or pro i'm like Who no cares? one cares that, no that one, is no one cares if you put up 40 points in you drew literally league. put up 30 points on a dude that's gonna go and sit at an office sit in an office yeah. in his cubicle tomorrow Who i cares? wonder what like the requirements are for like people to get into like a pro am game that aren't nba players i, I should have say. no idea i i, I really like don't. could could you show up and be like yo i, I want to run with the guys like, uh, i'm here as a celebrity guest <laughs> <laughs> Is there a tryout that you have I to do? Have no like, <laughs> frankly, I have no idea why these players want to do this because <laughs> all you're doing is putting your own health and career at risk, and you've mm-hmm. got Chet Holmgren as like this dude doesn't even have the body That's... to to handle that. How is he going to make it in this league? Guy's got all the tail in the world. How the hell is he going to make it in this he's league? Argue- you're arguably letting your number two asset just walk out there, and you could argue he's their number one asset. You could argue he's number one asset. Yeah. Like that that's just reckless on the part of the Thunder and reckless on the part of Chad Holmgren if he asked me. Mm-hmm. I'd be pissed if I saw Jaden Ivey there. Or Cade. <laughs> I wonder if like the uh the Thunder's GM, Sam Presley, knew about this. Or if he's just like walking down right now to uh to the front like to the rest of the front office, like right, who knew? Who knew he was playing in a pro am <laughs> <laughs> Who allowed this shit to happen? <laughs> Under and whose watch? And, and then he goes and <laughs> marches up to Chet Holmgren's door and pounds on it. You what see, the hell were you thinking? You see a bunch of firing Sagan boys tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> he puts an ankle bracelet on Chet's mm. on Chet's <laughs> ankle. You are not allowed to leave anywhere mm. but the gym, this house, mm. and your doctor's office. Mm. You can go to the grocery store. That's fine, too. All right. Uh, speaking of assets, though, James Edwards did his annual um, ranking of the Pistons' best assets going to the season. Mm-hmm. I'm curious of how aligned you are with him. If you could call out right now our top three assets on, like Troy Weaver's top three assets on this team, who would they be? Kate Cunningham. Who would it one. be? I'd put Jaden Ivey number two, and then I would put the forty some odd mil in cap space they've got at number three, and then mm-hmm. I would put Sadiq Bay, and then I would put their draft pick next year their number one pick mm-hmm. and then i would put duran stewart probably all the, livers at that point what all that far off to be honest with you like that's so, probably how i'd rank it he did have Cade in one you, he agreed with you there his number two is our 2023 first round pick see okay i'm probably coming from a position that i expect enough out of the team where that 2023 pick's not going to be yeah. that high in the lottery mm-hmm so, like, so, I expect them to be a fringe lottery team next year, like a 35-win team. Yeah, he, he's not saying it's going to be a high pick. He's saying, um, I'll, I'll sum it up here because it's like a couple paragraphs, but he's saying, assuming Detroit's in the lottery once again, and then I quote, even the slightest odds at landing Webb and Yama or Henderson with a top, one of the top two picks makes next year's selection valuable at this moment in time. So as people just want a ball in that, in that little ball selector. I don't know how you call Wait, it. Wait, repeat some of that. So you're, he's putting faith in not many he balls. Say, 
No, he's saying, like, assuming Detroit <laughs> is in the lottery once again, even the slightest of odds that landing Webb and Yama or Henderson with one of the top two picks makes next year's selection valuable at this moment in time. See, I look at the door in that lottery. I basically. look at that pick as being like 10th or later, mm-hmm. 9, 10. Like, I, I don't look at the Pistons as having a legitimate shot at getting Wembenyama mm-hmm. or Scoot Henderson or whoever. Which, by the way, how the hell would Scoot Henderson fit with this team? I don't know if he will. I mean, he's like a. I get he's like a, a, in a he's, loose. He's like, Killian Hayes with with uh, with Jay Ivey's athleticism. So I feel like, which I mean, that's pretty damn good. <laughs> you know, yeah, there, there's a reason he's a top three pick in this draft or projected right. top three pick. But like, he doesn't fill any kind of hole on this roster. Is all I'm saying. One but Yama's who you'd be going after. Yeah, well, I mean, absolutely. It's no doubt one but Yama. I mean, that guy just looks insane. But well, like, would would having Jay Ivey on the roster be enough to dissuade you from drafting Scoot Henderson? Oh God! Because by tough. all intents and purposes, he, he is supposed to be better. <laughs> he is. That that is tough to and give an answer to. Can I wait mm-hmm. and see how Jaden Ivey performs this year? Because <laughs> <Okay. laughs> I mean, we'll have that. We'll have that foresight yeah. at that point. Like we'll have mm-hmm. that. We'll know how Jaden Ivey looks after a full year of basketball. I'll I'll allow it. All right, sweet. <laughs> so he right, had, th- you said he had Cade, that draft pick, and then, and then what? number three is Jay and Ivy. Okay, that was his top three. And then he had Sadiq Bay four, like you did. Um, he sw- uh, he switched during the Stewart during five Stewart six. I believe you had Dur- Stewart. No, four I, Durant, had right? the, I had the I had the the. Well, you had cap space. That's the part. Cap space at yeah. three Bay four. Mm-hmm. The pick five, or no? I think I. I'm just saying you yeah. had you had Stewart over Duran, right? No, that's I had Duran over asking. Stewart. Oh, okay. Yeah, I yeah. He doesn't have the cap space. Okay. Right. I find that kind of interesting. I, I honestly find that interesting. Maybe he doesn't consider that an asset the way I do. It would have to be. He doesn't consider an asset because he has Olenek on here. And okay, so. <laughs> it's got to be. He doesn't consider uh, it an asset. Then. Yeah. I consider an asset, but um, but as he delivers to make the list at ten. But uh, Nerlens Noel was above him. Olenek was above him. Alex Burks was above him. Isaiah Stewart didn't make the list. Yeah, I said it was five Duran, six Stewart. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Who'd you say didn't make the list? I said Isaiah Livers made the list at ten. Oh, okay. But I'm, had... I was going to put Isaiah Livers behind like Stewart. Frankly, he's a young asset that can potentially. Yeah, be he something. is. He's, he's at ten. You could make an argument 10. that the trade value Olenek has is worth more than Isaiah Livers. He could potentially maybe because it with the expiring worth more in terms of contract matching. And, yeah. And so, yeah, yeah, with potential uh, the expiring deal there, like you, you could get something. Is he is he expiring this year? It's partially guaranteed at the season. Team only has to pay him three million dollars of his twelve point two million if they waive him. Basically guaranteed. Three million dollars, nothing. Yeah. For them, anyways. I mm-hmm. I, I should reiterate. Yeah. So basically, not guaranteed third year. Yeah. So yeah, so it's almost an exp- it's basically an expiring deal. So right. yeah, I could see that being an asset for sure. And no one's Noel is just totally based off who he is. Like, um, well, no, he's an expiring deal too. Yes, no one's he Jones, is. Yeah, Burks and Noel are both yes. expiring deals. I forgot. Yes. yes. How would you rank them? I would go Cade one. I think I'd agree with you that I put Ivy two, just because the level of, of athleticism Ivy brings is not something you easily find. Uh, right. It's an immediately translatable NBA level skill, um, so that like you at least have that in Jane Ivy. Uh, then I'd probably put our first round pick. Then I think I agree with Sadiq Bay. Uh, I agree putting Duran over Stewart. Now, if Stewart, what about the cap space? Uh, if Stewart comes out and is shooting thirty six percent from three, I might switch it. I would <laughs> probably agree with you, but where would you <laughs> slot the cap space in all that? That's a good question. Because um, it's a lot. Yeah, They've got the ability of, to make a big yeah. splash. Granted, we have talked Cap about space, how we don't necessarily love in, the yeah, crop of inherently players like it's, at the top. it's valued at what you could potentially get. And since the free agent class, again, is deep, but not top heavy. I guess I probably yeah. would switch the... I think I'd put it right behind Sadiq. I'd put it behind Sadiq also, and I would switch the Maybe draft even behind pick. Durin. <laughs> <laughs> I'd probably go looking at it. Cade, Jaden, the draft pick. Sadiq. No, fuck it. It's it's seven. It's behind Durant. I don't I'm think I'd put core. it behind Stewart. 
I'm keeping our core and then putting the the cast. I would probably put it ahead of Stewart right here, right now, Mm -hmm. unless Stewart comes out and shoots 36% from three, Mm -hmm. then I'll probably put it ahead of him. Yeah. Put it ahead of the space, Mm -hmm. but yeah, that's probably what I'd do is right ahead of Stewart. In between Dern and Stewart is probably where I'd put it. Mm -hmm. Thinking about it. Hmm. But so now judging is a big picture, like going to the season. How do you like the, uh, the treasure chest that, I think it's Boy, we wields. I think it's thin right now, mm-hmm. but it's building. Uh we we've got some really good we got a known really high end asset. Mhm. We have a potential really high end asset in J Ivy. Mhm. A possible mid-level asset in the pick. Mm-hmm. A known mid-level asset in Sadiq Bay. Mm-hmm. Who could potentially, if he continues to improve, grow into something more of a high end. But mm-hmm. I would consider him to be a mid-level asset. And some potential, but not like less of a percentage to hit asset, high-level asset in Jalen Duran Because of how much he's got to grow still. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then kind of low to mid-level assets in guys like Stewart and Bagley and the cap space like i i would consider that i would probably put the cap space is a little bit higher but it doesn't have as much weight it's thin though um you know say one of these goes down your assets are drastically hit at that point yeah say sadiq bay takes a step back or Jaden ivy doesn't quite perform that well well we're in trouble but that one of your assets increases the value of the first round pick it does but not well i mean the, there's a scenario where the team can still win 30 games if sadiq bay doesn't take a step forward or mm-hmm. Jaden ivy isn't as good yeah as but, but we can't but, but we can't say there'd be the team would be better by that happening no it's, but again, like and I said, my expectations assets, for this team are 35 mm-hmm. wins. They could still yeah. win 32 games and end up with the seventh pick or the sixth yeah. pick. Like that, that's not that mm-hmm. high of an asset at that point. Yeah. Granted, I'm it just does up, the, up it a little the, bit. The value of our high end assets compared to the to the uh, first round pick is negatively correlated. The more valuable yes. our high end assets get, the less valuable that first. But round then pick. you went nowhere, so you're still thin. <laughs> I just I don't see our I don't think our assets right here right now go that deep and are at the top like we have yeah because they're young really they're all asset. super young yes mm-hmm. so I I think we are building and definitely in the right direction and mm-hmm. I fully expect Troy Weaver to continue to add to this package of assets but I think we're in a good place we're in we're moving mm-hmm. and moving in the right direction here you know two years ago we had zero assets. <laughs> zero now we've got legitimately five six maybe seven good to great assets we, on this we team. had our two biggest assets were assets that we actually had to pay people to take off our hands yes <laughs> that's not a good asset that's that's a depreciating asset to an extreme yeah. the fact that we i mean i'm just happy that we got a what was it like a it was a mid-level lottery pick turned out to be for canard right yes like, that was more than i thought we would get for him yeah, I, it, on it, draft day, it, weird shit happens. With yeah, NSA. it led to part of our assets here. It led to mm-hmm. one of Bay or Stewart. I can't remember which one, mm-hmm. but like I feel like I, I'm trying to think right now who we what we try to remember what we traded to get the uh, 13th overall pick. Wasn't it, wasn't that part of the Christian Wood deal or no? What the the pick? That was the second pick that we we, we got okay. we, tra- we traded for two picks. Kennard was not part of the Christian Wood deal. So. Okay, Kennard was a separate right. deal. Um, was it just Kennard then? Yeah, we we, tra- we literally parlayed Kennard into a first round pick. Um, I mean, that's what he was. Yeah, Technically speaking, like from his draft position, it's it was a well, negative yeah. asset, but still, it worked out well. But um, I'm trying to remember right now what we traded to get Dern at the at, what we traded for the 13th pick. It was the yeah. 2025 pick from the Jeremy Grin trade. Oh yeah, that's what it was. Yeah. The 2025 first from Milwaukee. It was absolute chess when everybody else is playing checkers. And here we are, including us. We were playing checkers because we <laughs> ripped the shit out of Troy Weaver for yeah. making that trade with Jeremy Grant. We were like a 2025 first. What the hell? From we Milwaukee? And then, boom, <laughs> turns it into Jalen Darren. And we went, oh, all right. Well, this guy's smarter than we are. How <laughs> pissed are you if you're a Rockets fan? Because, um, 
it looked like the Brooklyn Nets were imploding, losing about to lose KD and Kyrie, and then now they're both staying. And now because the Rockets basically own all the future yeah. draft picks of, right. of Brooklyn for the next like eight years. So you know what. <laughs> I am starting to dislike the ra- the Rockets to a point where I'm good with it. <laughs> Is it bad that I dislike the Rockets to an extent where it actually forced me to be happy that Durant and Kyrie stayed in Brooklyn? I'm kind of in the same boat. Plus, I know it. And it was also kind of a fuck you to Durant and Kyrie. Like, it was. Ha, it, was a total, and, it was a total fuck you. To like that, that was the other part better. of my happiness. Was. Like, it, it was good in all facets because one, I know those two together will never win a damn thing. <laughs> two, it hurts ben the Simmons Rockets. In the mix. <laughs> Three, it was just total fuck you to those guys. Yeah, yeah, and heading Ben Simmons into that. that, that mm-hmm. Those guys will never win a damn thing. <laughs> So it was a good thing all well, across the board. Is Ben Simmons a better fit with them than Harden was? I do think he is. Mm-hmm. If Ben Simmons can get his mentals right, mm-hmm. I do think he actually could be an asset to that team. Mm-hmm. But I think I, I'd agree because they be they, they'll make deficit. up for the lack of offense that Ben Simmons provides. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> anyway, that's about it's all. It's not I another have. mouth you have to worry about feeding with that team. Like it, he doesn't need to score to be effective. He's great yeah. on defense and great at distributing the basketball. So. You don't need him to score. You've got two guys that can do that. Now, can they get along in the locker room? That we already know is a definite no. So I'm good with them not doing a damn thing. Mm-hmm. Did you know the Pistons were so, like, I think it was supposed to be like Cade, Beef Stew. I don't know if I of you was supposed to, Sadiq, I think was supposed to play. There was a program that they were uh, all supposed to go and play at. And um, something happened where they didn't go. Troy I'm sorry, Weaver better have Weaver. marched yeah, in that Troy, locker room yeah. and said, oh, hell no. <laughs> this is not happening. <laughs> I am not risking any of you. Because it, 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 going back to the acid thing, like, think about it. Say Jaden Ivey rolls his ankle again, and, and it's a little bit more severe than last time. Mm-hmm. How thin does that, ass, do that, does that asset li- list get at that point? Yeah, right. You're bringing, you're rolling mm-hmm. back a, what, what do they win? 25 games last year? 23? Mm-hmm. That's what you're doing. Rolling it back. So it that tells you how thin that there's not a lot of depth there. Mm-hmm. But hopefully they stay away from the pro ams and the Drew Leagues and the basketball tournaments of the world and they just work on their game themselves and amongst the less toxic players around the league and Yeah, like Cade worked out with stuff. That's like, great. It was a week ago that's, or so. Or that's a ago. wonderful. Mm-hmm. That's a champion right there. Yeah. Work with him. I love it. <laughs> Don't let Russell Westbrook anywhere near my players. Oh man. Well, I, I think this was actually a joint workout because um because I think Duran was there, Ivy was there, Kojo with, was there. With Steph? It might have been like a Warriors Pistons joint workout or Okay. Well that's I'm good with that. Or was it uh or was it a program? I don't know. But <laughs> either way, I'm good with him working with those. One of my guys. favorite posts was on was on Reddit. I remember, and it was like uh, it was at the picture of Kate and and Steph together, and um, yeah, the person posted on Reddit saying like like a future Hall of Famer, and I think that's Steph Curry. Next, so I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> future Hall of Famer and like Steph Curry. I think I don't know. Nice. <laughs> no, but, I. Yeah. I like that the guys are networking around the league. I, I do like that because at some point, players are we're gonna have to try to find a way to convince some higher end talent to come here. Yeah. At some point, and having the relationships built is gonna help that. Yep. So. Anyways, anything else to add before we close out? Do we got anything else here? That's all I got, good sir. All right, that is gonna call it for this week, guys. Thank you for listening. I hope. You guys are enjoying Hard Knocks, and I hope it continues to be entertaining and gets even better. Uh, it has it has been fun. I won't lie. It, it has been kind of fun to see. But like, Can we at least agree it's better than preseason? Oh, God, yes. It, it, a nap is better than preseason. <laughs> <laughs> Coincidentally, it's hey, usually not, when I not, take my naps. <laughs> not wrong. You're not wrong. Uh, but anyways, guys, thank you so much for listening. Follow us on Twitter at Real Fan Report. Follow Detroit Sports Podcast well at Detroit Podcast. This has been the Fan of Wars by fans. For fans. We will catch you guys next week. Enjoy your week and weekends. Have a good one. Peace out. Peace.